Hey guys, Marshall here. There's this case that's all about this lady named Kelly Stage Clayton, who died in Capone, New York. Her husband came back to the crib super late one night in September 2015 and found her dead. The cops who showed up noticed some pretty obvious stuff. At first, it seemed like the energetic mom of two had put up a big fight against her attacker, and it seemed like her hockey player husband, Tom, might be to blame. But as the investigation went on, things got murkier and more complicated. People started doubting the accuracy of the eyewitnesses, secrets about the husband's life came out, and different versions of what happened were compared to the evidence that was there. Kelly Stage was like, super outgoing and loved to have a good time. When she was in her 20s, she totally shocked her fam by quitting her teaching gig and becoming a cocktail waitress in Vegas, of all places. And get this, while she was back in her hometown of Elmira, New York, she actually crossed paths with Thomas Clayton, this hockey dude who played for the Elmira Jackals. Apparently, Clayton had been on the team for, like, four seasons before getting traded in 2005. Kelly met Tom and was like, hey, let's go back to New York and be together. So they got hitched and ended up settling in Cotone after living in North Carolina. Tom, who had retired from his fancy job, decided to start his own business franchise called Paul Davis Emergency Services of the Southern Tier. He was all about fixing up places that had fire or water damage. He also got a gig as a project manager at his buddy's franchise called Supro. Tom ran his business out of their crib and always had peeps coming and going for work stuff. Kelly was busy working at the Woodhouse Stadium Grill and taking care of their two young kids. It was a warm night with a chance of rain in Steuben County on September 28, 2015, in the small town of Cotton. Tom Clayton went to his regular Monday night poker game at the Millers with his usual crew. He left Kelly and their two kids, Charlie, 7, and Cullen, 3, at home. The poker game was nothing special, and Tom offered to keep playing into the early morning hours, since he loved gambling. However, no one was up for it, so he left just after midnight and headed home. Around midnight, he got to the spot and found Kelly lying in a bloody mess in the kitchen, already gone. Charlie and Cullen were okay, no injuries. Tom freaked out and called for help while taking his kids to a neighbor's place until assistance showed up. Officer Swan switched on his body camera when he got there, just a bit before 1 a.m. He went inside the house and saw Tom on his knees, totally unable to explain what had happened. The officer asked if there was anyone else in the house, and Tom said no. The paramedics tried to do CPR but sadly, they confirmed that Kelly had already passed away. The scene was super intense, like, there was blood everywhere, and the house was totally trashed. It all went down in Kelly's upstairs bedroom. Frames were knocked over and stuff was broken all over the hallway. And get this, the wall at the bottom of the stairs was totally dented from a major hit. The blood trail led from the bedroom to the kitchen, where they found Kelly's body. They didn't know what weapon was used at first, but it was clear that whoever did it hit Kelly multiple times with something blunt, not like a gun or knife. The cops checked things out real fast and noticed some key stuff. No signs of anyone breaking in and the garage door being opened didn't seem like a burglary. Even though there was a ton of cash in the house, the safes weren't touched. From what they saw, the officers figured it was probably a domestic fight that ended in murder. Tom, the main guy they suspected, didn't have any obvious injuries and there wasn't any blood on him. After a little while, some responders showed up and things got more hectic. They sent out the dog units to check out the house and the area around it, and they ended up finding a pond in the back. It started raining a bit as the night turned into a drizzly morning, and they carefully looked through the pond and eventually emptied it to find any clues. Captain Eric Tyner, the top investigator from the sheriff's office, took over the case, which was a big deal for the small town of Cotton and involved a bunch of different agencies. Instead of running out of the house, Charlie ran to her little brother's room to protect him. Afterward, she went to her mom and hugged her leg, and she heard her mom calling her name. The things Charlie described matched the evidence found in the house, showing that there was a violent struggle that started in the bedroom and went all the way to the kitchen. Because of this, investigators focused on getting any physical details about the attacker from Charlie. 
The little girl gave a rundown of the guy who offed her mom, saying he was in jeans, a black long sleeve shirt, and had a mask on. Tell me what he looked like. Mm. He was wearing jeans, a black long sleeve shirt, and a mask. Okay. What did the robber look like? He, he looked like my dad. And, and why do you say that? How did he look like your dad? The mask and his shoes. How about the size of him? Was he a big, big guy or was he a little guy? The size of my dad. Did the robber say anything? Mm -hmm. He probably didn't say anything because what if it was my dad? He, he, could, re he could recognize his voice. After getting a bunch of people saying the robber looked like their dad, Charlie finally said it couldn't be their dad because he takes care of them. This made the cops think even more that Tom Clayton killed his wife. It wasn't a definite answer, but the police took it as evidence and arrested Tom Clayton for second-degree murder after questioning him a lot. Even though the arrest happened, the investigation was still going on because there were a bunch of things they didn't know yet, especially why Tom would want his wife dead. People who knew the couple were pretty shocked by all this because they thought Tom and Kelly had a good marriage. But then Kelly's 16-year-old niece came forward and told the investigators some new stuff. She had worked for Tom over the summer and said that he talked bad about his marriage, saying he had been cheating on Kelly. He also said he couldn't leave her because he would lose everything. Before the murder, Tom upped the life insurance on his wife Kelly, maybe scoring himself a cool million. As more folks got interrogated, it became obvious that a bunch of Tom's buddies and co-workers had gotten down and dirty with him and heard him gripe about his wife. Proof revealed that while Tom was texting sweet nothings to Kelly, he was also exchanging some risque messages with another gal. The investigators in Steuben County were dealing with a case about a big fight at home that got out of hand. They had a witness who saw someone wearing a mask that looked like the one they were hunting for. The suspect had both personal and money-related motives to be involved. But the real problem was that Tom had a solid alibi. He was playing poker at the Miller's place when Kelly died, and several people can vouch for that. If Tom couldn't have been the attacker, the cops were like, who else could have wanted to hurt Kelly? The young niece of the Claytons kept pointing the police toward this dude, Michael Beard, used to work with Tom at SurfPro when she was there in the summer, but he got the boot not too long ago. Investigators found out that Michael had just started working at Servro for Tom, who had hired him before at another company. But Michael got fired from his job at Servro about 10 days ago. They found out that he was stealing stuff from the houses he was working on during the cleanup. And his co-workers were worried about him drinking while he was supposed to be working. Michael, who was having a tough time with money and falling behind on rent, was about to get kicked out of his place which belonged to his former boss, Tom Clayton. While being questioned, Michael mentioned that he didn't have any bad vibes towards Tom. Actually, Tom had always been there for him, trying to hook him up with job opportunities and even offering him odd jobs at his place. Kelly was super nice to both Michael and his co-worker Luca Tetralt. She would whip up lunches for them and even hooked Michael up with some hand-me-downs for his daughter that used to belong to Charlie. After the interview, the cops didn't really think much of Michael Beard at first, but that all changed real quick once they chatted with his wife Holly. They even made him do one of those lie detector tests, but he totally bombed it. In New York, they don't have to record police interviews, and this one wasn't. But according to later reports, they cornered Michael and basically made him admit to the murder. He came clean and said he went to the Clayton house that night to burn it down. The person had some keys to the house and used them to get in through the garage. They were planning to start a fire with gas canisters they found there. But things didn't go as planned when they bumped into Kelly in the bedroom. It turned into a crazy fight that scared them off, so they gave up on their original idea. After a big fight, he just ditched her on the kitchen floor and hightailed it out of the house without setting anything on fire. The cops nabbed Michael for offing Kelly Clayton. They found his DNA all over the place, and bloodstains by Charlie's room confirmed he was there when the murder went down, just like he admitted. Plus, he spilled the beans to the police about where they could find the murder weapon and other stuff connected to the crime. The cops went searching in a hidden spot near the Elmira Heights Horseheads border for a while. 
They used a metal detector and found a little something that they took as evidence. They also found some other interesting stuff near Hall Street in Elmira. But they haven't said exactly what they found in either place. One of the things they found was a yellow handle from a mall, which matched a piece found inside the house where a violent crime happened. Michael's coworker recognized the handle as being from a mall that had broken the day before when they were at the Clayton property. The cops found a bag of Michael's clothes in a swampy area, and they tested positive for having Kelly's blood on them. The keys to the house were also found in a nearby creek. Michael's confession was confirmed by his partner, Mark Blanford. Mark was like, I had no clue what was gonna go down that night when Michael came to scoop me up. Mark had pounded down like 10 to 12 tall boys and was told to chill outside the crib while Michael handled some business inside. They rolled up to the spot in a dope maroon truck and Mark peeped Michael grabbing some pipe-looking thing from the back. Michael dipped for a minute, and when he came back, he looked all freaked out and out of breath. So, turns out the guy who offed Kelly wasn't her hubby Tom, but this dude called Michael Beard. But get this, Linda Miller, aka Lucky, remembered something odd from that night. Tom actually asked to borrow her phone around 11 p.m. cause he claimed he left his own cell phone in his van. Linda got a little favor from Tom, but she got kinda suspicious when she noticed some weird stuff. She overheard Tom talking on her phone, but couldn't find any proof of a call being made. Plus, other peeps at the poker game saw Tom glued to his phone the whole night, so it was super strange that he straight up lied to Linda. According to Linda's call records, it looks like Tom used her phone to make two calls. The first call was to some fax machine whose number was kinda close to Michael Beard's. And then he made a second call straight to Michael Beard. Michael said that Tom had promised to give him $10,000 to kill his wife and burn down his house. Tom gave Michael the keys, told him where to find the gas cans, and told him to also pour gas on the cars to get more insurance money. The phone call made from Linda's phone that night was the important evidence the investigators needed. So now they were sure that Tom had planned the murder and was responsible for his wife's death. Like we said before, this investigation is still going on and things could still change. We got some evidence that makes it seem like we might charge the person with first-degree murder, which is a really big deal and could mean they go to prison for life with no chance of parole. The fact that they planned it out is also something we're considering. While on trial, Michael Beard changed his story and said that he was actually hired by Tom Clayton to set fire to his house for insurance money, not to kill anyone. According to him, he showed up at the Clayton's place ready to start the fire, but shockingly found Kelly Clayton dead in the kitchen. Everyone thought this was an unbelievable twist of fate. When he arrived, the lady was already dead and some guy who kinda looked like Tom was running off. Instead of setting the house on fire, he ditched a murder weapon a busted mall handle. He also got rid of anything else that could connect him to the place, but he accidentally left his DNA behind since he stumbled upon the crime scene right after it happened. Michael Beard was totally found guilty of killing Kelly Stage Clayton and her Cotton home. The trial went on for two whole weeks, with a whopping 52 people taking the stand. The 12 jurors talked it out for around seven hours before finally deciding. The prosecution and law enforcement are stoked about this being the first step in getting justice for Kelly. For Tom to be charged with first-degree murder, the jury would need to think that he paid Michael to do the crime. But since Michael took back his confession, he can't be trusted as a main witness against Tom anymore. The state would have to figure out a different way to show that Tom hired Michael. But they never actually gave him any money. The promised $10,000 for Michael never showed up. They never had any conversations that made them look guilty. Their text messages were mostly about work, and although some were suspicious, they didn't prove any plans to harm Kelly. During the phone call, Tom said he called Michael and offered him a job the next day. The job involved helping a player at a poker night move the deer blinds he had purchased. Another player also confirmed the agreement and offered to help. Tom's lawyers were saying that Michael Beard did the crime on his own and there wasn't any strong evidence linking Tom to it. But most of the evidence against Tom was indirect. The prosecution brought in an expert witness named Cy Ray who used software to collect data from different sources like phone records, cell tower info, and GPS data. 
Ray used this data to make maps showing where both Thomas Clayton and Michael Beard were before the murder. The data showed that Michael left his house not long after getting a call from Tom while playing poker on September 28th, around 11 p.m. According to GPS data, it turns out Tom swung by this place called an M Auto because he couldn't get any signal on his phone. He ended up using their phone and made a call to Michael Beard, which lasted just over a minute. On top of that, security footage from the area around Michael's apartment building and the Serve Pro parking lot gave us even more info. The day before the murder, he had made plans to swap vehicles with a co-worker called Luca Tetralt, who also pointed out the murder weapon. On a Saturday before the murder, Luca showed up at his place in a red pickup truck to borrow a four-wheeler for a weekend shindig. Then, on the next Monday, he casually proposed to Luca that instead of unloading the four-wheeler from his truck to his own, they could just switch trucks for the day. He would then unload the four-wheeler at home and give back Luca's truck the next day. Tom got caught on security footage unloading a four-wheeler at his place, parking a red pickup truck in the lot, and then heading to the poker game in a Surpro truck. After a call from Tom, Michael hopped on a bike that Tom got him and rode to the Surpro lot, where he took Luke's red truck and split. Around 12.30 a.m., the security camera caught someone bringing back the red truck to serve pro and then taking off on a bike. Tom's trial lasted six weeks and involved 75 witnesses and 400 pieces of evidence. Despite the defense insisting there was no hard evidence against Tom, the jury returned a guilty verdict for first-degree murder. Kelly's family was pleased with the result, but Tom's defense team was shocked. They claimed that Tom's polygraph test proved his innocence. Mr. Clayton is like, totally insistent that he didn't kill his wife or pay someone to do it. He's absolutely convinced that this whole thing isn't over yet. During the trial, Tom's lawyers were all like, the state didn't even share all the evidence they were supposed to, and that Cy Ray dude's testimony was straight up messed up. They said that Cyrie's fancy schmancy cell phone location thingy was a bunch of baloney and that they twisted the data to make it seem better than it really was. The court just said no to Thomas Clayton's latest appeal for his life sentence in his wife's death. The Shimon County District Attorney thinks there's no good reason for the appellate court to even think about Clayton's appeal. So get this, Michael Beard, who already said he was guilty, is now saying he didn't do it and is trying to get his conviction overturned. He's saying his daughter's description of the killer who she said looked kinda like him, proves he's innocent. But come on, he's this big, tall black dude, and Thomas Clayton looks nothing like him. Mark Blanford confessed to being the lookout in a murder case and got slapped with a three to six year prison sentence. Kelly's sister Kim was granted custody of Charlie and Cullen since they had a tight bond with Kelly. Kim said Charlie stopped talking about what happened that night, showing that it really got to her. On the flip side, Cullen kept calling for his mom all through the night, even after she was gone from his life. Don't forget to support us with your like and subscribe.